Welcome, ladles and jelly spoons, to King's Bishop Teaches Chess. I'm Coach Daniel, your host, also known as King's Bishop here at chess.com. And I'm bringing another edition of the World Championship Wins video series. We're in the midst of the second World Championship that was held in 1889. It was a, a match between challenger Mikhail Chigorin and champion Wilhelm Steinitz. A 20 game match and um, well it never got to game 20 because the winner got to the required ten and a half points before the 20th game. This game that we're about to view is the 13th game of the event. <clears throat> and after 12 games, Steinitz is enjoying a lead of seven games to five. So it's been fairly neck and neck, but uh, Steinitz managing a three game run from game eight to 10, emerging with a little bit of a, a gap. And so far, um, Chigorin has only won with black one time. That was game six. Steinitz has won with black twice, and that's been the difference, really. <clears throat> well, what are we going to have in today's event? As we see these two great champions face off with contrasting styles of play, Steinitz with his scientific approach to chess recognizing that for an attack to be sound it must stem from weakness in his opponent's position and taking the perspective that if such a weakness does not exist then attacking is not warranted and proper positional play would dictate that he must strive for the accumulation of several small advantages to build it up to an overall advantage. Chigorin, in contrast, one of the last great romantic players whose fighting spirit embodied the character of the Soviet school of chess, which would emerge in his shadow and uh, dominate throughout the 20th century. Chigorin rejected the technical, scientific, doctrinal approach, however, of Wilhelm Steinitz, uh, though he did accept some of the Steinitz doctrine, notably a belief in the soundness of the defensive center. And in fact, Chigorin's investigations into the closed defense of the Spanish game have proven to be of lasting value. <clears throat> well, Chigorin once again is on the white side of the board. Each odd-numbered game, Chigorin had the white pieces. And in all but game number three, a um, Evans Gambit has been played by Chigorin. Game number three, Chigorin employed a Roy Lopez opening, Spanish game. But other than that one game, it's been Italian, which we have here. So-called because it was first played by Italian masters as long ago as the 16th century, where White gets his bishop on the A2 G8 diagonal, Looking at the center and looking at the soft point on F7. And of course, um, 
depending on Black's responses, this opening can become an open game. It can um, facilitate gambit play, as in the Evans Gambit, or it can turn into a slower maneuvering type of game, which is the intention of the Juco Piano opening, by the way. <clears throat> now, the real benefits to the Bishop C4 move are that it allows for some very natural play. It does focus on the center here, although it does not undermine the defense, the attack of the center here, as the Rai Lopez does. <clears throat> and it allows for some pretty quick development in castling. Some of the famous practitioners of the Italian game include Giocino Greco and Sergei Tiviakov. Well, as mentioned, Wilhelm Steinitz played the Juco Piano, which he has played each and every time the Italian game has been deployed against him. Now, the words Gioco Piano are Italian for quiet game. And uh, that's what Steinitz aims for, a quiet, slow, maneuvering um, type of game. And usually in the Gioco Piano, White will uh, play d2 to d3 rather than trying to strike at d4. <clears throat> it's a very solid strategical game with little specific theoretical knowledge needed. The drawback is that it can be rather slow. A uh, few imbalances tend to be created, and the position tends to lack um, color. Now, Tiviakov also plays the Juco Piano in addition to the Italian game, and notably Gary Kasparov employs the Juco Piano. Well, Steinitz's desire to have a quiet, slow maneuvering game are immediately dispelled with the Evans Gambit. And that's the idea of pawn to b4 here. Giving up the b pawn. By the way, it's called the Evans Gambit because it was first employed by Captain William Davies Evans. Way back in 1827, he used it um, against the Irish great Alexander McDonnell. And um, he was on shore leave and went to London and met up with McDonnell. And that's where we have the first recorded game employing the Evans Gambit. So the idea is to give up the B pawn and to gain time by attacking whichever piece captures, whether the knight or the bishop. You're gaining time attacking that with this C pawn, where now that piece has to move again. And... Um, It's a very aggressive attacking idea and can prove to be dangerous. And, of course, he's going to strike at the center with d4 subsequently. But the drawback, obvious drawback, is that black starts the game, as with all gambits, upon uh, advantaged. 
And um, since 1827, when this was in first employed on record, uh, many good defenses have been worked out against it. Of course, the gambit can be safely declined with a move like bishop b6. But Steinitz happily accepts this gambit. c3 is played. Bishop a5 is the main line. But castling is the slow variation. The main line continues with d4. And then uh, it splits off either with Pierce's defense, named for William Timbrell Pierce, who lived uh, from 1839 to 1922, or David Bronstein's defense, d6. This is a slow variation because the pawn does not immediately go to d4 as in those other ideas. Well, Wilhelm Steinitz once again plays queen f6, and if you've been watching this series from the beginning, you can probably already say what I'm about to say. <clears throat> Don't bring that queen out early. We much prefer uh, that you bring out your knight or that you open the door for your bishop to get out. Don't bring your queen out early. And, um, in fact, in the database, the most common move is d6, appearing 72 times. And the second most common is knight f6, appearing 40 times. So we look upon queen f6 with the same disdain that we've held uh, in all the previous occurrences d4, knight g, e7, and now d5. And this is interesting because if you'll recall the previous videos, uh, I had mentioned that this was probably preferable to the previous tries by white. White first played in game one knight g5. And uh, Chigorin did win that game in spite of this move uh, not being the best choice. <clears throat> but then he changed in games, uh, in game three was a Ray Lopez, but games five, seven, nine, and 11, all four of those games, Bishop g5 was played. And, of course, bishop g5 is an improvement to knight g5. But I said at the time, I believe d5 is probably the best choice. Immediately driving the knight to the home rank. And um, taking advantage of that. Well, after knight d8, Chigorin plays bishop g5 now, and, and I don't quite understand. There's really no difference now when you play bishop g5. It just transposes to the same position as those previous games. What really makes this move better, playing d5 right away, is that you're not leaving your bishop on g5 where it can be attacked by f6. Now, I know that move hasn't been played, but I've said several times in those lines that f6 ought to have been played. So instead, queen a4 immediately, and we saw how effective this move was even in the positions where the bishop came out, only because black never never employed the resource of f7 f6 to hit that bishop but you'll recall in the previous analyses that that would have been an equalizing move <clears throat> so queen a4 leaves black with the same predicament of not really having a good way to deal with this 
either blocking off his B-man or moving the B-man and weakening his position. So bishop b6, for example, now <clears throat> bishop g5, queen d6, knight a3, bishop c5. And now we're hitting the queen. And, okay, queen moves, and knight takes e5. <clears throat> And white is left with an advantage. Now, you should note that this fork is not as good as it might look uh, because the continuation after bishop f4, pawn takes knight, bishop takes pawn. White enjoys these Harvitz bishops. This comes under attack. This comes under attack, and black is not in a very good position. White's surely winning this game. If he defends the G-man, bishop takes c7, and the queen is dislodged. And um, guess what? There goes that knight. And on the other hand, <clears throat> if, um, well, he surely can't castle. Let's say he castles. Knight takes c7. Rook comes under attack. Doesn't matter what black does. Let's say he counterattacks with knight f7. Well, you take the knight with tempo. I mean, you take the rook with tempo. And the same thing, queen's driven over, and you've got some good choices here. You may be able to let this go by playing this, pin the knight, <clears throat> There are quite a few choices. So, in other words, white is just much better. But by playing bishop g5, <coughs> you've just transposed to the same position as in previous games. Now... To my thrill and surprise, and you'll remember, black has tried bishop b6 unsuccessfully and pawn to b6 unsuccessfully, and several times I have said, play this pawn here. Well, he played it. <laughs> he played it here. And um, actually, white did not play the continuation I showed. Now, let me just put it on the board again. I had said after queen takes and pawn takes and knight takes. And then, um, let me think if I remember my own analysis... I believe I said then b6 and queen b4. And um, queen f6 driving the knight back. The knight retreats. And knight f7. Something along those lines. <clears throat> and black has at least equalized. Well, I gather... Chigorin didn't like the idea of such equalization because he plays bishop c1 here. So he must be going for something more than the suggested line. Bishop to b6 now. And again, this 
poor bishop and rook. <laughs> I don't see a good way to get them into the game. White played knight a3, heading for b5 to hit the queen. <clears throat> c6 is played, preventing knight b5. And um, white is insistent. He plays bishop b3 with the idea now of knight c4. It would have been very good, I think, to go ahead and get in line with your opponent's queen. You're defended. You have a discovery looming. But he played this move. Bishop c5. And now this actually is played, but now it's actually a mistake at this point because this queen is being trapped. So the whole purpose of this move, bishop c5, is to get out of the way of the pawn. And... Um, Somehow Chigorin did not appreciate the impact of this move. Uh, he should have played something like c4 to prevent pawn to b5. But he played rook d1 at this juncture. And b5 is played, and, and this queen is really out of play now. Knight b7 attacks the queen. Only one safe square. And here, queen c7 is the best move. Uh, but Steinitz takes opportunity to repeat the position a couple of times. And if you count, this right here is the third time this position has appeared. It was there on move number 15. It was there on move number 17, and now it's there again on move number 19. And so you might say, well, this should have been declared a draw. And in fact, the position is repeated one more time, or this position actually is repeated for the third time, which happened on move 16, move 18, and here on move 20. But... In those days, the threefold repetition rule had not been standardized. And in fact, if you watched the series on the 1886 World Championship, you'll recall that the Steinitz Zuckertort match had a sixfold repetition rule uh, that actually pertained to the moves, not the position. The same moves had to be played three times in a row. <clears throat> I mean, excuse me, six times in a row. Here, the same moves were not played three times in a row. Here, the queen came from a4, and here from a6. So, by their interpretation, that wouldn't have been a threefold repetition anyway. Keep in mind, the rules these days are that. If the position, if the Forsyth English notation is the same three times in the game, it does not have to be consecutively, then the game can be declared a draw. So by that rule, that would not have been the same, would not have been a repetition. However, Queen A6 from B A5 to B, excuse me, let's back it up to move uh, 18. A5, A6, B7, D8. A5, A6, B7, D8, oh, it, oh, I'm sorry, it was move 16. I'm just trying to show A5, A6, B7, D8. A5, A6, B7, D8 a5, a6, and again, on the third time, 
the queen played to c7. So by those rules, and it's important to understand that they use those different rules, uh, by those rules, this would not even constitute a threefold repetition because their rules were that the same moves had to appear on the board three times, not necessarily the same position. Nowadays, if it's the same position. So as soon as a5, a6 was played, that would be a draw in these days. Or really, as soon as queen a5 on move 19 was played, you could have declared it a draw. Okay, so hopefully that's as clear as mud and um, you're understanding why this was not declared a draw. Well, queen c7 is actually the best move here. And um, black's in, in pretty decent uh, shape in spite of the fact that his bishop is still sitting there. Why? Because this queen is, is trapped. The queen on c7 takes away the last remaining square from white's queen. So pawn takes c6, pawn takes c6, knight takes b5. He's literally creating or trying to create places to go. Queen takes b5. And that's how that came into being. So let's back it up. He recognizes now that if this move is played, his queen is completely trapped. So he says, I've got to give up some material to save my queen. So let me take that pawn so my queen can go here. He takes back. Well, then let me take that pawn and strike at his queen. He takes back. I'm taking back with check. So that's how he managed to rescue his queen, but it was at the expense of a knight for a pawn. Bishop d7 hits the queen again. And this is an interesting move right here. Bishop f7 check. Well, the idea is that you have two defenders on the d7 bishop and two attackers. If you can remove one of the defenders, then the d7 bishop can be captured. So this check attempts to attract the king away from the defense of this bishop, which, were that to have been played, the rook comes in with an attack on the queen, and the queen will likely have to move to where? I mean, let's say b6. And after queen takes b6, you can see whether he takes with the pawn or the bishop, let's say the pawn, the knight on b7 is undefended. <clears throat> so that's the entire, oops, so sorry. <clears throat> Didn't mean to do that. Let's get back to where we were. I'm such a professional. That's the entire idea of this tricky little move. So rather than go for that and let um, white regain material, black plays king d8. <clears throat> well, of course, that moves into a pin. The bishop cannot move. Uh, rook b1, super attacks by battery. And knight d6. 
Now you might wonder, well, could I have attacked the pinned piece with the bishop? Would that have been a good idea? Because after all, the bishop is pinned. Doesn't that amount to the same thing? Well, as you can see, the knight would then block there, and he'd save his knight. So instead, he made the battery on the B file. The knight still moves to D6, attacking the queen, but also attacking the bishop. So bishop to B3, excuse me, queen to B3 defends the bishop. Now queen to B6 creates a battery here, puts the question to the queen. The rook, if the queen doesn't stay in communication with the rook, the rook's left undefended. <clears throat> Quite a powerful strike here because the bishop is also under attack. Black is clearly winning here, isn't he? White is left with um, an, an unfortunate position. However, white has a resource that can save his material. He simply plays queen c2, defending the rook, attacking the queen. That makes the bishop safe because black is not going to give up his queen to capture this bishop. <clears throat> So the queen has to move to safety. So this is a very good move. It, it answers the attack against the pawn. It answers the attack against the, the rook. And it answers the attack against the bishop by creating a counterattack. What a nice move. So queen is c6, and now white can retreat his bishop to safety. Pawn to a5 now. Bishop to e3. Bishop takes bishop. Pawn takes bishop. Now, black is looking really good here. He is clearly winning this, but he's not without weaknesses. This king and two pieces are all on the same file as white's rook. And black should get out of the line of, of white's fire. The move a4, therefore, is going to be a mistake. It looks good because it strikes at this bishop, and I'm sure it's not losing. Um, because white has to deal with this threat and he has no way to immediately exploit this attack. Bishop d5 creates a skewer, but it's an empty skewer because the knight can capture. But the rook captures, and this is beginning to be punctuated now. Rook e8. Um, perhaps also rook a7 is an idea to help defend. He's getting this rook into the game. And the rooks are doubled. And you have two attackers only one defender. So rook e6 is played to add defense. You could add a third defender here. White did not choose to do so. Instead he's saying, I'm going to play the pawn up and chase this knight out of the path and expose your king. But he can also play queen d3 and add a third attacker. But king c7 
would add a third defender. And so it it might not be successful. White's tact is to try to force open the file with his pawn. Rook a7 is now played, and there's c5, and knight c8. This is defended adequately, but barely. Um, knight d2. Yeah, I'm not sure where he's going with his knight, but he's interfered with his battery. Does he have anything better? First, what's he trying to do with his knight? That's the next question. Maybe he's trying to get his knight up here. I, I'm going to guess that's where he's going. So he has to temporarily interfere with the battery. Is there another thing he can do with the knight? I mean, I guess if he comes this way, he's still going to interfere with the knight. <clears throat> I mean, with the rook's battery. All right. Well, that's what he played. King e8. Yeah, knight to c4. Rook to e7. And then the knight d6 check didn't get played. Now, why didn't he play that? It seemed like that's what he was going for. I mean, I gather it becomes irrelevant once the king moves to f8. And he's pretty safe over here. <clears throat> Queen e2. A3. Problem with A3, he does not uh, recognize the purpose of Queen E2. The purpose of Queen E2 is to give check here and weaken Black's position. So he can stop that move by playing King F8 right away so that this is not check. <clears throat> So if he plays queen h5 now, for example, the king can just step over to g8, or the pawn can play to h6. In any case, his position is intact. <clears throat> so a3 allows queen h5 check, g6, and now queen h4, and we can see a little crack appearing here. You still have this knight trade off, and the rook comes up, and you may be able to um, break things up here. Rook a4. Rook a4 totally ignores this threat. This is not a good move at all. So Steinitz, I think, in this one move, oh, why does that keep happening? So sorry. So, so sorry. Let me find where I was. Right here. So sorry. I keep bumping the wrong button. They're all so close together. And the button that advances one move is right next to the two buttons that advance either to the end or the beginning. <laughs> so Steinitz has to deal with this threat. And he doesn't. The best way to deal with it is to simply defend. And now the discussion is over. And um, white is really behind here. But with this one move, okay, and it looks so good because after all, the knight is undefended. Now you could play knight d6 check here, but even better is the move that Chigorin played. Rook d6. 
attacking the queen. He's, he's basically saying, all right, do you want to give up your queen for a miner and a rook? And um, black was not interested in such a trade. Now notice, rook takes knight, rook takes queen, bishop takes queen. That's eight points for nine. But this pawn is in question and allowing the white um, queen into black territory with such initiative cannot be good. So even though the bishop can take here, he can't come this way because of the rook, so he has to come this way, and things are going to go downhill from there for, for black. Comes here, back here, the knight's hanging. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's not going to be a, a line that black can play. In some situations, giving up a queen for a rook and a minor is justified, not in this one. So knight takes. And now knight takes with check. Interfering with the queen's defense of this pawn. So king d8, queen takes pawn, rook a5, queen f8 check, rook e8, unfortunate, miserable, queen, a rook, knight takes rook, Queen takes pawn. Queen takes queen. Not sure that's the best idea. Keep your queen in line with the king. The bishop is pinned. So, come on your little Hunt, but keep your queen on the board. Keep the pressure, either g8 or h8. <clears throat> keep that threat alive, that discovered check alive. So perhaps queen e7. Well, discovered check. And obviously, if king c7 is played, you've got a fork. And black can resign right here. It's going to be a rook against a queen. And of course, the queen is going to just gobble everything up. <clears throat> so I didn't like white's decision to trade here. I don't know that black has anything else. Um, what if he tries to give check? King runs away. Yeah, there's nothing left. There's nothing left here. So this was not a good decision by white to capture here. He's probably still got the advantage. <clears throat> All right, you can still super attack here. Rook c7 defends. And now the king comes in, pieces are traded off. And really this king is gonna open up the A file and this A pawn will do the rest. This king cannot defend these pawns 
and stop White's Pawn both. So as it turns out, I guess the simplification was okay. He must have been able to see this line all the way back there when he played queen takes c5. Yeah, on principle, black should probably try to keep the opposition, but it's not going to matter. Um, white is going to just pick off this pawn. And, yeah, okay, you've got this, but, right? The king has got to mind this. He cannot come after any of these weak pawns. As we see in what was actually played, he played h, uh, excuse me, he played h5, king b3, g5, king takes pawn, king c4, and black comes after these pawns, but he's not fast enough. White is only uh, six moves away from promotion. And as you can see, black is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine moves away from promotion. So for that reason, you know, black really has to stay in the square of the pawn with his king. But the problem with that is that will liberate white's king to come in and pick off the, uh, black's pawns and promote one of his others. Black, recognizing that, said, if I have any chance at all, it's going to lie in getting one of these pawns promoted. And I'm not, I don't know why he didn't pick this one off. Perhaps he wanted this to be any uh, an obstacle to a queen giving check on the third rank. But this is how it played out. <clears throat> Queen was made, pawn to h4, queen g8, pawn to h3, queen takes g5, king h1, queen takes e5, and a black resigned. Um, look at the scores here. Let me read them to you. You can't look at them because... It's not on the screen, but Chigorin's accuracy was 97.77, and Steinitz's accuracy was 95.18. So both very high accuracies in this game, both very high best move ratios. Chigorin's best move ratio was 68.8%, and Steinitz's best move ratio was 61.9%. When you're better than 95 accuracy and better than 60% best move, you're supposed to win. <laughs> but not when your opponent is 97.77 and 68.8% best move ratio. So quite a game. And once again, Chigorin is staying in striking distance of uh, Wilhelm Steinitz. So the score now stands after 13 games. Seven for Steinitz, six for Chigorin. If Chigorin can string together two in a row, he will tie up the match. So it's a very tight race here after 13 games. <clears throat> I hope the game was... Uh, helpful to you. I hope you learned something from it. And uh, tune in to the next time. If you can support the channel, please do so. The PayPal link is below. If you'd prefer to sell me, uh, give me a contact. I use a different email address for Zell than I do for other things. So email me at the address that's in the description below if you want to use Zell. Otherwise, use PayPal. Please consider supporting the channel if you're helped from these um, lessons. And especially during this time of coronavirus, um, 
The only income I have is whatever comes in through these online donations and lessons. If you're interested in lessons through Skype, please uh, contact me at the email below. And until next time, have a great day and play some great chess. Bye now.